Thank you for joining us today. So um, my name is Anjali Sastry, and I, we're going to be introducing ourselves to you in various ways in the coming minutes. Um, but I am thrilled to be joined by two other colleagues from MIT Open Learning. And we're going to use this time to tell you what open learning is and what some of the work we're doing uh, is. OK, so. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Calimera. Uh, my name is Caterina Baghiati. Uh, I am a principal research scientist at MIT Open Learning. Um, should I give a brief intro about open learning? or You should say, what do you think open learning is? What do I think? Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> it's an umbrella that in the last decade we are trying to pull in all interesting initiatives that have to do with developing learning opportunities or studying learning opportunities, starting from the pre-kindergarten level all the way up to K-12 higher education, workplace education. Cool. Terrific. <laughs> Hi, everyone. You met me yesterday, but I'm Kathleen Kennedy. I am the uh, senior director at MIT Horizon, and I also do research at Sloan as the executive director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. And this was a fun exercise for us to talk about what open learning is um, from our, each of our perspectives. Um, I thought the, I think umbrella is an interesting word. When I was thinking about it, I came up with federation because it's a federation of different projects, experiments, platforms, products, um, that are all, I think, trying to fulfill the MIT mission that is about um, advancing education on science and technology, um, specifically, for the betterment of the world and um, for the 21st century. And so I think I thought that was a really interesting way of thinking about it, that we're that this is these groups that are also, I think, using the mind and hand method that MIT is so um, sort of famous for um, and exploring and really pushing the boundaries how education can be done in new ways. Yeah, I think about the actual title, open learning. What does it mean? And I really love the name open learning because I feel like it can sound like an imperative. We'd better open learning. We'd better open it up. But it also invokes a whole movement that has played out in many sectors, but certainly has a lot of roots, even in the Cambridge area, of making resources open to more people. Um, and I like this idea of opening the doors of, of MIT and inviting the world in, in various ways. But what does that mean? Not everyone can come to our campus, our university isn't that big. So we're all working on different offerings that can open learning by bringing ideas, materials, research to many. And as you'll hear in the coming minutes, we're actually approaching this from many different ways. And we thought the contrast between them might be really interesting. But we also thought you might want to know a bit more about us because um, we have very different backgrounds <laughs> here in this uh, small panel. Uh, and so I thought I'd spend just a few moments to rewind. Uh, and I'll start, but invite my colleagues then to follow on to say, well, who are you? Who am I? How did I get here? Um, I was a traditional faculty teaching at the Sloan School of Management. But before that, even, I'm someone who grew up in multiple countries, including India and the UK, came to the US and discovered a very different style of education. I, my mind got blown very early on when I, um, weirdly enough, organic chem chemistry. Realizing you don't have to memorize the equations, you can actually learn mechanisms and derive them. What a world. Like I learned, I'd grown up memorizing things and then to, to know that you could actually understand them at a deeper level, MIT really got me thinking differently. And that really built a lifelong commitment for me in figuring out what was so cool about MIT that I could bring to more. Uh, so I've taught in many different programs and devised many different classes, many of which were not that successful. <laughs> but uh, the idea of going even further to open up 
learning at MIT is really what got me interested. And I've joined Open Learning in uh, last year as the uh, faculty director of the Jamil World Education Lab. But your paths have been so different. Tell us about yours. Oh, sure. <laughs> Let's see. So, I, I, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, I had been the president of the MIT Enterprise Forum Global. Um, so that's, that was my affiliation with, with Greece, one of them. I also, I married an uh, MIT alumni <laughs> who is, is also Greek uh, and a doctor and a scientist. And so really got embedded in sort of the MIT ways of that. But I, I, I get distracted. Let me go back to the beginning. Uh, let's see. I am not a classically trained science person. I'm actually more of an entrepreneur. I was trained in business, uh, accounting major in college and worked for a startup and uh, hadn't actually even realized that I would, I would love that world and, until I, I just uh, had worked for a big accounting firm and realized I didn't like that. So it was more of a rebellion of going into uh, a startup and found out that I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, in the 90s. Um, I was working on, I traveled a lot with that and I was working on a project in Boston in 99, and that was at the height of the dot-com boom. Sort of a really interesting cycle, um, and startups were huge. And mm -hmm. the Boston market at that time mm -hmm. was so vibrant and mm -hmm. exciting. I thought, wow, I, I think I want to find another startup here and work on that. And I found this job at MIT <laughs> that was really interesting. The, the first startup I worked on was uh, in media research for movies. And this, they were looking for a media research specialist to help. They were taking the um, alumni magazine, Technology Review, which had just turned 100 years old wow. and was an alumni mm -hmm. magazine that not that many people know about. Mm -hmm. Most of you in college mm -hmm. probably have some alumni magazine. Mm -hmm. But this one, um, they wanted to spin out into a magazine that was mm -hmm. like Wired or Fast mm -hmm. Company or, or Fortune and had started to hire a spin-out team that was gonna do that. And so I joined that team and I thought, great, this mm -hmm. is a really cool startup. But I also thought that's what they wrote about and I would find another cool startup mm -hmm. from there. I never thought that mm -hmm. I would go work for MIT mm -hmm. and I never thought that I would like get mm -hmm. deeply involved in science and technology. Mm -hmm. 2001, the, the, the market fell out. MIT said, no, we're not gonna do that spin-out and ended up staying at MIT, and then have had now two decades on being on the front line of being an entrepreneur in MIT, um, taking Technology Review, that alumni magazine, into a global media company with multiple uh, divisions uh, and product sets around the world. Uh, then I launched, uh, took over the MIT Enterprise Forum, uh, launching the Greek chapter and another, a, a number of other chapters around the world. Uh, I launched a program called MIT Solve, um, in which listening to the last speaker was one of the reasons mm. back in 2014 mm -hmm. why we launched that. Because all of that is real, but we wanted to give people ways to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's really the MIT way mm -hmm. of we're thinking about it, but we mm -hmm. want to roll up our sleeves and actually cool. do. And we're going to see the threads of all of this experience shining through in the work you do. But let's hear quickly Oh, sure. From Sorry. Yes. Yes. I'll come yeah. back to all of yeah. that. Oh, Go. Yeah. So I think I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> I, uh, I started my career by studying electrical and computer engineering in Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Uh, I jumped into working in a company and very quickly I realized I am not a corporate person. I don't like industry. I love mm -hmm. education. All this time I was doing like volunteering work with refugee children and new technologies. Then I found a job as a computer and technology teacher in a middle school and high school. Hmm. Also, this was the era that Greece started to add elective courses in the engineering schools hmm. about didactics of engineering. Hmm. So I started teaching these courses, hmm. but something was missing because I was teaching the way I was thinking this is the right way, but I was never trained in education. I was a pure engineer. Mm, uh, and that was the time that all this global discussion started about how should you really teach engineering and technology? Mm -hmm. It cannot just be a lecture. This is a very hands-on thing. Mm -hmm. 
we have to change that. And this is when Purdue started the first school of engineering education. I moved to the state. I did my PhD in engineering education. And right when I was graduating, MIT started this huge collaboration with Singapore to develop mm. the new Singapore um, mm. University of Technology and Design. So I jumped into this collaboration and I am now in MIT for, I don't know, I lost counting, 12, 13 years. Um, that's me. That's perfect. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk a bit about what more sort of granular level, what each of us does. And that'll help us understand some of the programs that fit into, what were you calling it? A federation. A federation. A federation. Or umbrella. Okay. Yes. The wild world of, of MIT open learning. Uh, so who'd like to start? Katerina? Sure. So I am a principal research scientist. I uh, am working in multiple projects in MIT open learning, starting from K-12 engineering education going all the way up to working with Kathleen in government projects about AI, working with Anjali in international development of engineering schools. Uh, but MIT Open Learning always feels that when you're developing something, everything has to be evidence-based. So whenever we're developing a new program, we are trying always in parallel to do evaluation research about it, like see how it develops, see how it what we can change, how soon, mm -hmm. in what way. So mm -hmm. I am involved in these projects with my yeah. research team doing yeah. the, the continuous evaluation of, the, of all these projects. Yeah, you know, one of the projects we've been collaborating on is, it's really interesting. It's looking at building um, a whole new university in Uzbekistan and having someone with Katerina's experience come into the conversation at the national level in the country raises things that weren't on people's radar screens right at the beginning. You said, if you don't build a new university hands-on, we talked a lot about how can we put more hands-on learning into it, but we also talked about how do you know if you're teaching well or not? You actually have to bake that in from the start. Yep. So the evidence-based thinking about good teaching goes in there, but it also can help inform a culture that looks for evidence. Even in the students as they go, they are realizing, oh, I need to be the kind of person that builds my approach, my practice, my personal, professional practice based on evidence. Yes, and so it's become so a habit of mind. Yeah. Uh, that the yeah. students will keep following when they are professionals in their work, in the startup, in, in whatever they're doing. Yeah. What about, tell us what was the most interesting part of the Singapore university you worked on? What, what aspect of that new school most surprised the local, the sort of existing well, educators Singapore and students? Singapore had two huge universities that were very traditional. It was very lecture-based. Mm. And the culture is also very top-down. So for them to do the shift and allow students to take initiative, allowing students to select their projects and form their teams, that was a completely new thing yeah. for them. Also, another thing that was very surprising to them was the concept of, of failing in a project. But as engineers, we know that whatever you're developing, it never works in the first yeah. time. It never works in the second yeah. time. You need to keep trying. Yeah. In that culture, failure is a very big stigma. Yeah. So we had to fight that and tell them that it's okay to fail because yeah. this is your learning opportunity when you're failing. Yeah. Bring it back in class and learn from it. Yeah. You know, there's a nice echo to the way that GSW itself is organized, right? Mm. This is a student-led, students make it happen event. And often I will tell colleagues around the world about this and they cannot believe it. Like you would, <laughs> why are students doing this? Surely you have professionals. <laughs> but we, this is a very um, MIT aspect of education. And what's interesting if we look at a university like SUTD is um, part of what had to happen is the schedule had to be protected so that students would have enough free time and be actually blessed to do extracurricular work, to build their own stuff, to go into the, you know, the, the, the machine shop or wherever and, and tinker or to, to together design some event or 
it's and it was radical because it meant you actually they actually had to argue for protecting chunks and not filling the entire academic schedule with classes. Again, not usually done in many settings. No, but this is because we have run studies in MIT. We know that there is a huge set of skills that you will need as a professional that you just cannot develop in mm -hmm. class, like yeah. leadership skills, team building, budget handling, management. Yeah. Like you need a real experience, and we yeah. teach that by yeah. allowing our students to participate in in their own student-run organizations yeah. that we just like yeah. uh, help them maintain. How lucky we are to have experienced senior research scientists able to jump in and advise us, you know, either through a quick conversation or through an ongoing research relationship. And Kathleen, I know you use exactly such relationships in the work you do. Tell us more about Horizon. Absolutely, because Katarina and I work together on some projects. But let me first set the stage on what Horizon is. Um, so thinking about, I've got sort of that entrepreneurial piece, took Technology Review, which is a magazine around emerging technologies, and we would um, write about that. Had a team of writers, website, all kinds of digital projects that, that products that, that did that. And that was more on an editorial base. What I was really interested in is how, looking at the world and how things are being disrupted by technology, Companies need to upskill their employees on a constant basis, as Katarina was talking about, like the world is changing. People need tools. You can't just go to school and get a degree and then think that that's going to carry you for the next 30, 40 years of working. It's not happening that way anymore. Education is changing. I was really interested in that. And emerging technologies and MIT is really good at training on that. And not at the MIT level, but actually how can someone at a, at, a, at a company just learn about AI from a very trusted source? So I was interested in looking at that sort of beginner and intermediate level. Horizon is a platform that does that and thinks about, it was built for how does someone who is at work need to learn? You have five minutes to understand like, what is machine learning? Just like from a trusted source. You have 10 minutes to sort of just look at an infographics or a quick video that will, that will teach you something like that. That's how people are learning. So it was looking at research that's saying that people are learning in different ways. And how do we, like, test some of those new modalities? So I come from a background of running teams, spinning up new products, and then working with large organizations such as governments and corporates. So I came into open learning to take what has had started as Open Horizon, uh, as at Open Learning as Horizon, to really scale this out. We've been doing that with working with large organizations. And then on the side, we also are doing research. So I work with Katarina on an ongoing basis on studying and having a constant feedback on what we're doing, what is working, how are people responding and learning, and launching new products in a very iterative, I think, um, entrepreneurial style that MIT Oh, for does. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the most popular topics? On your platform? Oh gosh, I, I'd say um, you know AI is 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 huge, and uh, we we've been we we're going on two years now of a study that we've been doing around that on how to do sort of AI 101 for an organization that has millions of people, millions, millions. Wow. And so how do you, and, and, and thinking about an organization, every individual has a different experience mm -hmm. and really needs to, like, they have different needs. You maybe understand this, but you don't understand this. So we're looking at how do we create mm -hmm. stackable mm -hmm. content that people have, there's prescribed learning journey mm -hmm. that a, an organization can say, you know, you need to do this two hour segment mm -hmm. and you'll get a sort of a mm -hmm. certificate on that or discovery mm -hmm. that you can, you can find what you need, follow a path on understanding different things. We just spun up a, a whole, and we're constantly updating things. Mm -hmm. So what's going on in the world, like generative AI, mm -hmm. we, we've been doing a whole series on that. Mm -hmm. um, we have different modes. So there's, you know, short articles, there's short videos, inner, uh, infographics, but then we also do um, 
weekly events where we bring in experts okay. and we, they just talk for 15 minutes. So you just hear bite-sized something and then you can ask questions and, and hear from your peers on what, are, what, are, what do people like me think. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, we're spinning up a new thing called Impact Spotlights that it's not just understanding a technology, but you want to understand how it's being applied by people. And so we're creating a massive library mm. of very short case studies, mm. very short, so that you can understand how something's being applied in the world. Mm. Um, that will help inspire you to be able to solve a problem. So can I probe on this multi-million yeah. person organization with an AI bite-sized, well-designed AI learning agenda? What's the point? Is it offered as a kind of like bonus for the employees? Do it if you want. How does it align to the organization's goals? And are they making people do it? Or is it extra? So there's, there's, there's one segment, um, sort of the mandatory aspect yep. of things, that's, yep. that's, that's we'll, let's yep. call it for the sake of it, the AI 101 journey. Yep. That is, that they're, they are making mandatory. Yep. Because what they want is, everyone in the organization yes. to be saying words yeah. that they understand in okay. the same way. That's really okay. important because yeah. you're probably thinking, wow, there's Google and I could yeah. just Google and get yeah. definitions of things out there, right? Wikipedia is a terrific, terrific tool. The issue with that is, is that if you have everyone just Googling different things, they're going to have different understandings of things. Yeah. They will have different definitions. They will use slightly different jargon. And yes. so this is a way for everyone to be on the same page. Yeah. But then it's also a tool that if, if I mean, everyone here has probably had to do mandatory things mm -hmm. at their work oh, yes. that you have to do and yeah. you sort of just check, check, check and yeah. do it. But the thing is you never go back to that. Like yeah. it's not actually, that's the, what we think is so important about this is that it's also a library that you can then go back to. It's mm -hmm. not a video that you watched that you're never going to be able to find that thing again. Mm -hmm. But that is something that you can always go back mm -hmm. and reference that. Mm -hmm. That's why we think infographics, like mm -hmm. seeing those charts, understanding how like how something works mm -hmm. and being able to go back to that before a meeting, using mm -hmm. that to explain to someone else. So that's what's really important. It's very entrepreneurial, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Also, I, you can imagine the value that comes when everyone in the organization has shared baseline knowledge. That's right. Because then your conversation can build on that. What an amazing benefit for you, but you better get it right. That's the other thing. Like that, that baseline knowledge needs to be very well validated. That's why MIT as a provider for this makes a lot of sense. But there's a big market out there doing similar stuff, isn't there? There, abs there yeah. absolutely is. There's, yeah. there's, 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 there's Coursera, there's LinkedIn Learning, and I'm sure there's a lot of different local brands throughout mm -hmm. Europe. There's, you know, uh, you know, lots of different things like that. I think what's, what's, interesting about this is that we have the research backed area we are always we do gap analysis and understanding where are the areas where we're deficient we have um, we always have faculty review um, the content mm -hmm. to make sure okay. that it is really grounded yep. and based yeah um, but I think that we're also um, <clears throat> open to we're making sure that that this learning science is yes. injected into it right. and that we're very responsive we work right. very closely with specific clients yep. on what do they need. Yep. And then you so inspired by yep. our like research across MIT, yep. injecting that in. Yep. We never want to we're never gonna be the biggest like yep. we're basically studying university, but I think mm -hmm. we we strive to make sure that we're the best. Cool. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Katerina, I was thinking it would be really interesting to dig even deeper and understand in a kind of more integrated, comprehensive way, how these are just some examples of the work that MIT Open Learning does in different modes for different markets, if you will. But can we, are we getting any more integrated insights out of this experience? I mean, we've heard some of them already about needing to really ensure the quality of information and learning about keeping the material fresh and yet accessible, that's a really interesting challenge. 
and injecting learning science and knowledge that we glean at MIT and through studying our actual own efforts as well as the literature. But give us an idea of like where this goes, like what is a new thing we can do by so, connecting all these things? Yep. So a new <coughs> discussion that's ongoing in the last two years and you both are involved in it, uh, so you know about it, is it started with this question, how do we better upskill, reskill after I graduate what next? Like technology keeps moving, new information keeps coming in. How do we maintain this, uh, this space? And we are experimenting with a new concept. It's called ACE. That stands for Agile Continuous Education. So um, what we had been doing all these years is if, you, if you're a young professional, let's say, and you realize that, okay, I need some more knowledge or I don't exactly like the path that I'm working on, mm -hmm. I need to shift. Mm -hmm. Like the traditional way was that I'm stopping from work, going mm -hmm. back to school, do a master's or something mm -hmm. else, like for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then after these two years, like then I'm going back to the workforce and I'm mm -hmm. applying whatever I learned. But uh, first of all, that mm -hmm. is a privileged perspective yes. that means you can stop. that you can afford mm -hmm. to stop mm -hmm. working for two mm -hmm. years, go back to school, mm -hmm. pay tuitions and fees, mm -hmm. somebody feeds your family for two years and after that you hope that whatever you learn is not already outdated because it can be. So we needed to find another way that is more um, affordable, that is more quick, yeah. more flexible okay. and that would allow you to use whatever you're learning right now yeah. so we are um, playing with this idea of what could be this agile continuous education model and from our studies and from the science of learning we know that different learning modalities help you develop different skills mm -hmm. so we came with this model that is based on three pillars mm -hmm. uh, so ACE needs to have a component that is independent learning, usually that could be like a MOOC, there are hundreds, mm -hmm. thousands of MOOCs that, that are now online. So you could take a MOOC and like mm -hmm. develop some disciplinary knowledge. Like okay, some update. So an online course. Yeah, It could be an online mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. um, it should be, the second pillar should have like a group learning component. Okay. It can be like a bootcamp, it can be a big workshop, something. Okay. And we want that because with the group learning with your peers, you are developing a different skill set, like okay. you're developing the team building, the negotiations, the, okay. the coordination of a team. But then on top of that, we want a third pillar that is a real life, authentic mentored learning mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. This could be an internship somewhere, mm -hmm. like a project in a real company, mm -hmm. a collaboration with the industry, mm -hmm. uh, an apprenticeship, like mm -hmm. Europe has a big history on apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. So we want to find a way to combine mm -hmm. these three things. Mm -hmm. And this is not just useful for the person who's participating, this is also useful for the society. Like we had a whole hour listening about disasters and that means that we need all the scientists that we can get, all the engineers yeah. that we can get, all the professionals. We cannot yep. afford to have them out of the workforce for years, yeah. right. bringing them back in. Yeah. So we need yep. these people to stay active while they yep. keep on learning the best way possible. So yep. this is our, uh, our yeah. ACE model. You know, what's interesting is we're getting questions in that, that link very nicely to the themes that you've already been raising. Because people, it's sort of the answer in a sense, but I think we can dig deeper. Sure. People asking, what are some of the uh, biggest challenges facing traditional education models and how is open learning innovating to overcome them? And you've done a lovely job of providing an answer to that, as have you. So these are two different views that because we sit in the same general area, we're constantly trying to talk to each other and figure out what do we learn by the contrast case? What can we find? What can we also find if we try mashing them up or finding an intersection? But um, people are very curious about two things. One is how far can online learning alone take us? That's a very common theme here and in the world. And another is how do we get our experiential learning more widespread at scale and good. <laughs> do you have thoughts on the latter? How do we get more experiential learning out there? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a very tough one. 
uh, well, I'm, I'm wearing the university, uh, the academic mm -hmm. hat right now. Mm -hmm. I think uh, many countries have started to experiment with an open education model, the open mm -hmm. school model, mm -hmm. starting even from the K-12. Mm -hmm. That means that they are collaborating with local partners to try to bring yep. up real problems yep. in the school. And that yep. can be at scale because there are many yep. problems in mm -hmm. the society. Yep. You're never done with the problems yep. in the society. So yep. that would allow more and more students to participate in real problems yep. and give them like real yep. world experience. Let's, to give you an example, we collaborated with uh, a private school in Hong Kong yep. and we sent students and teachers there for a summer and they chose the real problem, which was the water pollution in the, in the hub mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. And the students starting from the age of eight mm -hmm. with whatever scientific knowledge they had started mm -hmm. to try to understand like this inquiry based learning on yeah. how would I solve that? Yeah. What mm -hmm. is this? Then uh, at the university level, we need to switch kind of the culture. We have to understand yeah. how do we bring not just the industry, like the local community, yes. to bring us the real problems, like yep. Solve yeah. is doing. Yep. Yep. Uh, but then the discussion shifts because then that means you need new accreditation mechanisms, exactly. new credentials, yeah. new ways to evaluate whatever yep. progress is happening. It's, it's very easy for an academic to give you a multiple yep. choice test and say A, B, yep. C, A, B, C. But when you're working on, a thin, on an authentic problem, how do you evaluate what's going on? So this is a huge And in many countries, um, adhering to national standards means that you have to get really creative around linking yep. experiential learning of this kind yep. to the requirements of a degree. Yes. But wait, you know, it's interesting because through JWell, the Jamil World Education Lab, where I sit, we work on projects at all levels of learning, but I'm actually thinking of one we're doing in K through 12, where the government of Belize realizes if we really want to take seriously solving the world's problems and hands-on learning and STEM and evidence-based thinking, we're actually going to build, we need to throw out our old high school model and right. build a new one. So we're actually collaborating on building a new school in Belize which is taking local problems as the front and center kind of of a STEM <coughs> curriculum and it's a STEM focused school. But we did a really cool startup project with them that mm -hmm. I, I got to see some of it, of looking at how can you reuse the waste from coconuts, which are plentiful in Belize and kids and teachers alike, thinking of creative new ways to use the, you know, the husks or to use the leaves or to use the, there's a sort of thick part of the bark and really, really interesting to see people saying, I walk past these trees every day and now I'm learning some science, some technology, and I'm building something in a maker space and linking it then to my curriculum. So building new schools is a really interesting way to do it. It's easier to do in a country like Belize or Singapore that is relatively small. Mm. It's a tough thing to do in a large yeah, setting. Sure. And it's not always the route that we're gonna be, wanna take even. So sometimes, at least in my area at JWell, we partner directly with uh, universities, educational institutions of various kinds, sometimes with nonprofits. So our new Start Smart collaboration is a collaboration with nonprofits that are trying to reach many with the tools of learning how to become a better entrepreneur. So that's a new direction for us, but our traditional members are large scale universities all over the world, as well as some schools, some other nonprofits. For instance, in Jordan, we work with um, Save the Children, as well as the Ministry of Education to improve and address huge gaps in education for kids, which includes a large proportion of refugee kids. And interestingly, we end up focusing a lot on both teacher and student mental health issues mm -hmm. and stress. And we link, we are also discovering, because we're doing systematic surveys with Microsoft, that um, lack of resources and lack of physical resources, as well as help for stress and mental health needs is really affecting learning. So mandates are getting pretty clear, but we're trying to equip our partners there with knowledge and toolkits and useful curriculum materials 
that maybe can reduce that part of the stress while making the case for the other things we're, we're learning about. I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about one of our new initiatives, um, but thought I'd give you, Kathleen, a chance to jump in with any thoughts you have on how we connect things across open learning and where you see new opportunities. Students, some of the, the questions that have come in that may release um, that may spur some answers here is um, how is MIT Open Learning collaborating with, oh, I just lost it, with um, other educational institutions with industry and other organizations to advance the field of education and derive innovation. That's everything. That's our whole, whole panel <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. But your collaboration with, with other so, entities might be interesting. So I can talk about, so yeah. let's see, let me do one it, within MIT. So beyond open learning. So one thing, I, like I said, I have a joint appointment. So I have an appointment also at Sloan. And one of the areas that I was really interested in is organizational design. Yeah. Because I think, especially AI and new technologies are fundamentally changing the way that we work. Mm -hmm. So that you you actually, I mean, we all have this. 10 years ago, we didn't mm -hmm. have these mm -hmm. sitting with us. They didn't, weren't in our pocket all the time. And now we do, what does that mean? It changes the way that we work. But we haven't actually really changed the structure often. Mm -hmm in the way that we work mm -hmm. intentionally. And I think that's, that's I've been working on a framework um, called the Supermind Design Methodology that is looking at how do you, how do we fundamentally change the way that we work, integrating in technology, in the loops of humans in the way that we work. So I'm taking that and then pulling that into how, how helping create not only learning about technology, I think is part of one part of Horizon is understanding AI, mm -hmm. understanding 5G, understanding mm -hmm. IoT, but then what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. so, so thinking about lead, organizational design, leadership, innovation strategy, sustainability, diversity, inclusion, these are horizontal topics that we're looking at weaving into just not only teaching people about technology, but what to do with it. And so that's a really important piece. Then secondly, like I said, uh, Katerina and I have been working with a very large organization, governmental organization, and helping them to think about transformation. So it's not only sort of these learning paths that we talk about, not only an always on access learning library that mm -hmm. people can access, not only thinking about technology and frameworks and how to transform, mm -hmm. but then the different modalities. So one of the things that we're working together on trying to figure out, and I'm, I'm you know, have been inspired by mm -hmm. some a program, an experiment that NATO's been doing mm -hmm. on strategy and war mm -hmm. gaming and thinking about that's really interesting. How do we bring in gaming and decision making mm -hmm. in to looking at how do we do team based workshops mm -hmm. that right now are something that's done in person. Mm -hmm. and is very expensive, mm -hmm. very high touch. People love it and you really learn. But how do we, how do, we do take that methodology, those great results, mm -hmm. and do it in a hybrid fashion, mm -hmm. and then do it in a purely digital way mm -hmm. that we can get a lot of the results, mm -hmm. um, but do mm -hmm. it in a way that's much more sustainable and accessible to a large amount of people. So speaking of a large amount of people, People would want to know, can they take, can they sign up for Horizon? Explain if people sure. in the room can do it. So right now, Horizon is a product that we're, that, that is really done B2B We've, because oh. we really, we partner with companies. So if you have a company or you want your company to get this, it mm -hmm. is, it's priced in a way that is, is like per learner. Okay. And accessible. Okay. But we right now we plug okay. in and work with companies. Okay. We're thinking about looking at ways that that mm -hmm. we will go more of a B two C model mm -hmm. as well. But we don't have mm -hmm. that right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine that working directly with companies lets you also not only sort of customize and track, but learn from everything from outcomes, but even okay. from usage. So that because now you've got a whole client that you can see which AI modules are they double clicking on and where are they going back again and again. And that could give you guys a ton of really useful knowledge. 
That's really interesting. Okay, so we got a question I thought would be fun to discuss. Um, somebody's asking us here, how do you tackle the challenge of localization? What if we are instructing in a different language or we're trying to serve markets in different languages? And this is a massive challenge for open learning. You're seeing parts of what MIT Open Learning does, but we have many more offerings. We have, for instance, Open Courseware, mm -hmm. which is a, our nonprofit uh, foundation and uh, um, supported effort to open all of MIT's courses uh, to the whole world by making them available asynchronously um, as well-documented syllabi course materials and sometimes even full video suites. But that's in English because we're teaching in English. Well, so we're getting a lot of interest in. So at MIT, we are actually partnering with Google for live translation. Yeah on a new um, test of Google's ability to actually do live video and other translation. And we, we have some pretty cool corporate partners. We can try out some of these things. So with. I've been talking, so Kurt's yeah. the guy that, that yes. leads uh, OCW yeah. and yeah. I've been talk uh, talking to him about like, how's that experiment going? Yes. And as soon as you yeah. get it to work well, yeah. I want to do that. Yeah. So we're translating right now. We are doing it. We've, we looked at, um, do you use Google Translate and then humans to do the last mile? Mm -hmm. Like what's the best mm -hmm. way to do it? Mm -hmm. And frankly, right now, because we are really a B2B trusted source, we're doing full human translation to yep. start yep. because we think that localization aspect yep. um, is really important. So yep. we're doing Spanish right now. We're in yep. the middle of doing that. Mm -hmm. But I'm keeping a close eye on what Kurt's yep. doing with OCW because yep. I'd like to look at the Google model yep. and then perhaps do that at a much broader scale. Yep. One really but interesting thing, Katarina and I think of that. talk a lot about. Yes, translation is, is one thing. Exactly, but then you have to shift exactly. things from your local context. Right. To Absolutely. Somebody else's local. Yeah. Context. Yeah. So we we are offering all these like courses and homeworks and videos to everybody, even if it's translated. Our instruction is never copy pasted. Like yep. the US educational system is completely different to the Greek one, completely yep. different to the Spanish one. Yep. So if you want to think about equity in education, yep. you have to, first of all, you have to allow your students to participate in your class. So my advice is always take whatever we're giving you for free. It's really high quality resources, but then spend time to adapt. Mm -hmm. Adapt it, not just to your local educational nomenclature, find examples that your students will relate to yep. or even allow your students to yep. bring in their ideas yes. about problems. So yes. use it as a starting framework, but yes. not like as a copy paste mechanism. Yes. Hmm. And in fact, that is a massively important research question to say, how do we know? We know things work when we get evidence from an experiment or a test, even if it's a natural experiment or even if we're not necessarily randomizing ex ante, but we have good enough data that we know it works. Does that mean it'll work everywhere? No. The answer is obviously no, but how do we then figure out, how do we take on that task of figuring out what works where and why? That's a bit meta, but it, we should be going there. So in fact, JWell is really recognizing that if we were to really pull out our core research question, it is that question. That question is how do we scout the MIT ecosystem for amazing things that we know work? And then how do we put, array them in front of our members and then collaborate with them in their journey of implementing so that we learn from the very act of figuring out what works from their side. That's why having a membership organization with a two-way dialogue is an incredibly rich vehicle for us all to learn together. It means though, we have to invest in not only trying to find the right resources, create the interactions and bring them in front of people, but then we also need to invest in tracking mm -hmm. and learning even and qualitatively to, and quantitatively. To do that, that also touches on national policies about yes. education because yes. uh, depending on every country, like yes. the requirements and the um, and the space that every teacher yep. has in the school is completely different. Yep. So 
at the policy level, there should be opportunities in the educational system that would allow a teacher to bring a new concept yeah. to class, yeah. have the ability to experiment with yeah. it without getting punished if it fails. Yeah. Like in MIT, we have yeah. these experimental courses. We have the yeah. um, the S courses. The, yeah. Yes. So we can yeah. like, or even we have yeah. like the IAP. Yes, that semester too. That if I have a new right. idea, I can just go into right. it for a month. Mm -hmm. I've done that happens, many times. I will never get punished yeah. for that. No. And yeah. this is the only way to learn yeah. if it's if it's working with my students yeah. or not. So yeah. it's never detached from, it, it's also a political discussion. So in that respect, that's part of Jaywell's journey is we're now doing multiple efforts that where they, our partner might be a university, but they're tightly linked to the national policy conversation. Um, because for instance, baked into policy and certainly into norms is that if you have very expensive equipment, let's say, a lab for doing nano research, it should be the, the final experience. And the, the students should take many years of course, lecture coursework before they're able to interact with expensive equipment. And at MIT, we've flipped that. And you can learn how to, you can actually walk into our new nano building and get access to state-of-the-art machines as a first week freshman at MIT. That is That requires a major shift in mindset and in some cases even policy to flip your approach to learning to say you don't have to earn the right to be hands-on. You actually have to intertwine it the whole way through. But that's also causing us to really, and, I, and that conversation with our partners has been really, really interesting. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I'll take a quick look at our questions. But while I do that, um, I, I know my colleagues have some thoughts they want to maybe weave into the conversation too. So if there's anything you think it's important to uh, make sure we, we think about as we wrap up, please. So I will just finish since, since we are discussing about uh, the startup workshop. Uh, I would recommend you as you start your your endeavors, whatever it's a small startup or it's going to be a huge business, think of your learning strategy early on. How are you going to be learning? How are your employees going to be learning yeah. as you will be building whatever you will be building? Good. It should be built Good. in your business plan from the Good. very beginning. That's excellent. And each person needs a personal learning strategy, but as Kathleen's argued so well, the collective needs a learning strategy, both to know as technology and science and the disciplines advance, they're kept up, but also to collectively be able to talk about something you've tried that has or hasn't worked and why, right? That, that sort of experimental mindset, every entity needs that, small or large, old or new, but startups really need it. <laughs> they really need to like pull the learning out of their experience at the right level. Don't overgeneralize, don't undergeneralize. It's a minefield out there. So <laughs> more power to all you entrepreneurs out there, harnessing all the experiences you, you have access to and using them to drive your own learning. Anything you want to add Absolutely. on that? Um, I would say I'm sitting here in a chair very similar to one I sat in with Steve Wozniak, mm -hmm. who uh, this was the mm -hmm. founding CTO of Apple. And he's right now really passionate about education. Mm -hmm. And he said, what if every child Mm -hmm. had a teacher from from being a child to here you know on here you know yep. he had he had that yep. and and that was that was probably 14 years ago mm -hmm. and i remember thinking that's very cool i want to do something about yeah. that and i love that i am right you are you are and so that, that's something that inspires me <laughs> a lot and i think right i'm just starting to see <laughs> that i think it's possible Okay, so if you want to learn more, come on over to our website, openlearning.mit.edu, and you'll find untold resources. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>